On this week's episode of Ride the Lightning, the Tesla unofficial podcast, the Model S improves its range across the board yet again. The Tesla Semi is aiming even higher for its final top-end range. The mystery of which future Tesla vehicle Giga Berlin will be building is resolved, and more. What's happening, friends? I'm Ryan McCaffrey with you for episode 278 of Ride the Lightning, this one for November 29th, 2020. And I hope everybody in the United States listening that was celebrating had an excellent, safe, happy, fun, tasty Thanksgiving. I was lucky enough to have that. I think Thanksgiving might be my personal favorite holiday. I mean, there are a lot of fun ones, certainly, but I do love the food on Thanksgiving, like the traditional stuff have good memories of it going back to it as a kid. So I love Thanksgiving. I enjoyed it. Good times. Uh, Daisy the Boxer Puppy with me, of course. She's on the couch to my left. And I wanted to say thank you to everybody for sending in uh, some well wishes for her. Thankfully, she cleared right up. Uh, It was really kind of like a one-day thing, like day and a half. I'd recorded that night and talked about it last Friday night. The next day, there was hardly anything, and and after another day or two, it was completely just gone. The cough, little hack thing was gone. Uh, An extra special thank you to Patrick from Winthrop, Washington, a veterinarian who called in with some helpful advice. So thank you, Patrick. Thanks to everybody for uh, for keeping keeping your thoughts on Daisy the Boxer. She seems to be doing great. Uh, Real quick before I get going, just in the spirit of tasty food... If you are in the San Francisco Bay Area, but even if you're not, there this place does ship. I wanted to recommend two of my absolute favorite, just incredible vegan bakeries. Uh, they these these both these places make completely. They're just non-dairy. No, it's it's all vegan stuff. In my case, it's a dairy situation, but it's all vegan food. And the first one is Wholesome Bakery. If you look up Wholesome Bakery, San Francisco. In my opinion, the best vegan treats ever. The the cookie sandwiches in particular are so good, you'd really almost not even know that they're non-dairy. They're filled with like a coconut cream. Absolutely incredible stuff. They've got a lot of neat stuff too. But yeah, if if you get a chance, if you're in in my area or you want to do an order from them and have it shipped, great stuff. Also, uh, this one I think is local only. I'm not sure if you can get anything actually shipped anywhere Donut Farm. They're based out of Oakland over in the East Bay, east of San Francisco Bay Area here. It's all vegan donuts. And my good, my goodness, they are so tasty. Again, I'd put them up against any dairy-based donut. They are that good. So check them out. Uh, a couple of good vegan recommendations for you. All right. Anyway, let's get on with it. More range increases for the Tesla Model S. This car just continues to get better. The first of these updates goes to the Long Range Plus, the range king of the publicly available electric vehicle market as of now, as of things that you can actually purchase today. 409 miles, just a a slight bump up from 402. Now, I have to say somebody on the Tesla Reddit already made the Formula 409 battery chemistry joke and beat me to that. So uh, to, to whoever that was, I tip my cap. But the point here being that Tesla has squeezed another seven miles out of the Long Range Plus Model S since that recent update that got it over the 400-mile threshold to begin with. You know, it was sitting at 402. And by the way, this is from the Monroney sticker on the car. Uh, in fact, a Tesla employee alerted me to this. So this is official. It's actually not reflected on the Tesla.com website, on the design studio, as of me recording this. But it's it is true. It is legit. You know, we'll have to remain. We'll have to wait and see if super recent build S's will get a software update to reflect this. Uh, if they're you know those cars already have it in there, or if there has been a any kind of physical change to the pack or to something else that's only in the new 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 build cars from here on out. But uh, we know that that 
409 will be beaten in about a year's time, if not by Lucid's Air, but by Tesla themselves with the Plaid Model S and its new 4680 cells. And we already know for sure that it has a larger battery pack as well. Elon had confirmed that quite some time ago, in fact. I mean, in this case, it's gonna be bigger batteries plus better batteries in the form of the 4680s, leading us to at least 520 miles of range in the forthcoming Plaid Model S. But that car is gonna start at $140,000. In the meantime, today, we're talking about a 409 mile Motor Trend Car of the Century winner that starts at $69,420. That by the way, uh, it may not be a Plaid Model S, but it can still get down the drag strip pretty quickly, thank you very much. It's zero to 60 time is 3.7 seconds, which just for a little historical context, we're talking about a mm, 4,500 pound sedan, give or take. And that zero to 60 time of 3.7 is the same zero to 60 time as the original Tesla Roadster Sport. So the original Roadster was 3.9 seconds and then they, they tweaked the motor, uh, the, the stator, I think, was a different. It was like a tighter wound. It was wound tighter or something. Can't quite remember off the top of my head. But anyway, the Roadster Sport ticked it down to 3.7 seconds. And now you have a generationally good car that's practical as heck that can do that, uh, that same 0 to 60 time <laughs> and weighing quite a bit more while doing so. So that is really, really impressive stuff. Now, speaking of performance the Model S performance on the 19 inch wheels, specifically the Tempest wheels, that's what they're selling now. That one was at 348 miles, that performance S. That one has now ticked up to 387 miles, which is a pretty significant bump. Meanwhile, if you wanna go with the 21 inch wheels, the twin turbines, that performance S was at 326, being bumped up now to 334. That is a 2.3 second zero to 60 car on super nice looking grippy 21 inch tires and wheels that still gets 334 miles of range. Now, what does all of this tell me? One, that Tesla's engineers have squeezed an amazing amount of efficiency out of a car that really on the outside has barely changed at all over the course of eight years. Now, it's obviously changed quite a lot under the hood, including the wheels, the tires, the wheel bearings, the suspension, the battery pack, the motors, the drivetrain, etc. So it's what's interesting is the Model S, it may still re be retaining the same exterior, the same skin, other than the 2016 refresh to that front end and a couple of other little bits like the chrome trim around the, around the rear air diffuser went away. That's one of the little things you can, that's how you can tell a, a, a refresh Model S from the back. Anyway, everything but the body itself effectively has been improved and, and upgraded in the Model S, everything. I mean, it's, it's, it's really not even an exaggeration to say that. I can't prove it, but all of the major components to the Model S have been upgraded and improved over from over their eight year ago counterparts. It's pretty incredible, really. Now, secondly, I also wanted to mention, again, those 19 inch Tempest wheels for the Model S. Again, with all due respect to the Tesla design team, I personally find those wheels to be hideous. I've spoken about this before, so I'm not gonna keep picking at the scab here because I don't want the Tesla design team to take it personally. They're clearly designing for a purpose, which is this, which is range, getting the most aerodynamic wheel possible. And they have obviously succeeded in that. But what those wheels may lack in form, they clearly make up for in function. I mean, again, look at the difference in the jump made with the Tempests and then the jump made with the 21 inch twin turbines. The Tempest went up 39 miles on the ludicrous S. The performance car gained 39 miles, you know, th with these wheels on it. 
Meanwhile, the twin turbines, which have the same everything, everything's the same except the wheels, only went up eight miles of range. That's pretty telling for what kind of effect these the wheels can have on the efficiency of, of well, any car, not just an electric car, any car. It's a, it's a thing we don't really hear much about or talk much about with gasoline cars, but it's there on every car. Now, I know what I'm about to say is very much California privilege speaking here, and, and by that I mean in the, in the sense that we don't have snow here in the San Francisco Bay Area, and we're lucky that our, I would argue that our roads aren't great driving around them every day, but they're not so bad that, uh, I mean, I, I know, I have friends and family members on the East Coast that say, I would not put the big wheels on my Tesla because the potholes around here are just too crazy. The potholes will just eat, <laughs> just destroy my wheels. So I totally get that. But just that that being said, living here, if I were buying a Ludacris S, I would absolutely take the range hit and take those 21-inch twin turbines. For me, they just look a hundred times better. Subjective thing, I know, wheels, like paint colors, wheels are a, sub- a subjective thing. But hey, they look great. You still get well over 300 miles of range. In fact, if you charge the ludicrous, the new ludicrous Model S with 21-inch wheels on it, if you charge it to 90% every day, staying within that recommended range that Tesla recommends for daily charging, your 90% charge is still going to be right at 300 on that car. 300 miles of regular daily range in a five-seat family sedan that quite literally cannot be defeated off of the line at a red light. That's pretty awesome. Uh, Speaking of range increases, by the way, the Tesla Semi got one too, even though that vehicle is not yet out, of course. It's now projected in its final ultimate form. The goal that Tesla is shooting for is 621 miles of range. Again, that's the new target. And if that specific number sounds familiar, if you're thinking, wait a minute, 621 miles, where have I heard that before, seen that before on Tesla's website? It's because that 621 is the very same number that the next generation Tesla Roadster, uh, Roadsters, at least current, the still what's still on the website, that is the range projection for that car. And on top of that, 621 is significant because it is, drum roll please, exactly 1,000 kilometers. Speaking remotely this past week at the European Battery Conference, Elon Musk talked about the Tesla semi-truck discussing this range and confirming that, yes, as expected, it will have the structural battery pack. I want to thank, I'm not sure if he's a listener or not, but thank you to Christian Bauman for recording Elon's appearance at the conference and putting it on YouTube so that I could take a listen to it and get you these audio clips. So here's the first clip with Elon talking about the Tesla Semi. Well, I think this is really just a fundamental um, calculation of, of, you say, like, what's the energy density of the uh, the battery, of the cell, and then of the battery pack, and then of the integrated battery pack and truck uh, chassis. Um, so it's a so, so total mass of the um, of the, the semi truck before you know before including the trailer or anything, and and can you get that mass down to something which is comparable to existing uh, diesel trucks? Um, and I think the answer is absolutely yes, and we demonstrated that with uh, prototype trucks, um, and so uh, getting a range of uh, let's say uh, five hundred kilometers is, I think, quite easy, like trivial, to be frank, um, for, for a semi-truck. Um, and this is assuming a truck that's uh, pulling a load of something on the order of uh, 40 tons, 40 metric tons. Um, so um, just a heavy truck. Uh, and then you can take the range, if you, if you want, for long-range trucking uh, up to, we, we think, uh, easily 800 kilometers, and we see a path over time to get to a 1,000-kilometer range. Uh, with a heavy-duty truck. This is, like I said, truck uh, on the order of a 40-metric ton 
uh, total mass. Um, uh, and uh, we think this is going to be extremely competitive and compelling to uh, the, the trucking companies. Um, and we actually have a few prot prototype semi trucks that are in operation, have been, been in operation for over a year. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, some keys to that are having, like I said, a high um, energy density cell and then integrating that cell into the pack uh, with a minimum of, um, extra, of extra mass. And then uh, using uh, having a structural battery pack where the, the cells and the, and the battery pack actually form part of the core structure. And this is also something that we um, talked about at Battery Day and that we will be, of course, implementing with the semi-truck. And the net result is uh, you're able to carry uh, the, the basically the same cargo as a regular diesel truck like this. We think maybe there's a, um, a one-ton penalty, maybe. But at this point, we think possibly you can even have less than a one-ton uh, payload reduction uh, and it could long term I think be zero payload reduction for, for electric trucks so sort of a you know in terms of like put, put numbers on this that are specific uh, you know something like um, uh, around a 300 um, uh, 300 watt hours per kilogram something like that uh, at the cell level uh, is enough to to get to these the, the high ranges that I talked about, sort of the 800 kilometer range. Well, to me, this seems like proof, and I'm using air quotes with the word proof, or at least a firm indication, let's put it that way, that the new 4680 cells and structural battery pack were not part of the original Tesla Semi plan. The way he's speaking here, it sounds to me like this is all a new plan. A better plan, yes, but a new plan. Now here's one more clip from Elon's 20 minute or so appearance at the aforementioned European Battery Conference. And here he's talking about which original car, future vehicle, that Giga Berlin might design. The, of course, the toss up here, the, the question has been since what, battery day, I think, whether Berlin would build the hatchback, the hot hatch, the let's call that again, the Model 2, or the compact sedan, aka maybe the Model 4. And that's what, again, that's what I'm going with for now, Model 2, Model 4. Uh, so here's Elon answering that question. Um, yes, absolutely. So, um, you know, I, th I think there's, there's just a lot of talent, um, talented designers and uh, engineers um, in Europe, of course. And uh, it would, I think for a lot of the best people, they really want to work somewhere where they're doing original design work. Um, they don't want to just be, you know, doing, say, the European version of something that was designed in, in California. So I think it's important for, in order to attract the best talent, um, to, to do original design. Um, and I think, uh, you know, possibly uh, in Europe, it would make sense to do, um, I guess, a compact car, so perhaps a hatchback or something like that. And um, something, something that, like, well, what do most people want um, and uh, in, in a given region um, or what is a very popular approach to take? Um, you know, in the US, US, the cars tend to be bigger for personal taste reasons. Um, and in Europe, it tends to be smaller. Um, and, uh, I mean, if, you, if you're trying, if you're trying to, to park in a dense urban environment, having a car that is um, that actually fits, fits in a parking space easily is important. Um, I was driving a Model X around Berlin, and we had quite a bit of trouble finding a parking space that we could fit. So, um, I think that, you know that would probably be a good candidate for original design. Um, but there, I'm sure there'd be others as well. But I, that, that that might be the wise place to start, um, and it, it helps us also say, okay, we need a car that people can afford, uh, that fits their lifestyle and everything. And so, probably something like that would make sense. Um, yeah, I'm excited about doing some original design in Europe. Well, this makes sense to me. The hot hatch made in Europe, primarily for Europe, and the compact sedan made in China, primarily for China. But I do think, and I certainly hope, that in both cases they will be sold in other markets. I mean, there's no reason why they wouldn't be. I mean, it just happens to be that Tesla models now have all been designed in the United States, 
but they're sold in plenty of other markets. In fact, most other markets. The hatchback, that is what my wife will be eyeing. Her Mini Cooper is 15 years old already, and she's she's just dead set on having a tiny car for city life here. So if the Model 2, again, going with Model 2, <laughs> if that thing hits the market in another, oh, three to five years or so, she will be ready. Uh, I tell you, I can't wait to see what it's going to look like because it's going to be designed not by Franz von Holzhausen and not by Franz's immediate California team, but by the new Berlin team that's going to be uh, spinning up out there. So it's because that means it's it's not going to necessarily share any design language with the other Franz design Teslas. Although then again, I asked Franz about Tesla's design language in my interview with him last October, and he said, paraphrasing, there really isn't one. If, you, if, you, if you're a newer listener, by the way, I interviewed Franz on episode 220, if you'd like to go back. And it was literally three weeks before the Cybertruck unveiling. So there's no Cybertruck talk, but there's, a, there's talk about pretty much everything else. So if you haven't heard that, I would encourage you to take a listen when you get a chance sometime. But in any case, Franz saying in that interview that there really isn't a design language at Tesla, and well, the Cybertruck is certainly proof of that. It has absolutely nothing in common design-wise with any of the other Teslas. So I guess the, the moral is, per Franz, anything can be a Tesla as long as it's awesome and as long as it's functional. So very eager to see what the Berlin team will cook up for the hatchback. Uh, now, I mentioned the next-gen Roadster a little earlier in the podcast when that, that magic 621 miles of range number came up. Speaking of the next-gen Roadster, and yeah, I'll just see how long I can keep these not-super-great segues going. Elon finally said something. He finally commented in, in a... Uh, Meaningful is not the right way word to say it, but he finally said something kind of tangible about the new Tesla Roadster in the year 2020 because it's pretty much been a year of radio silence this year. He hasn't, although so was 2019, really. But anyway, that's something that Elon finally talked about with regard to the Roadster was this, quote, we will have special colors for the new Roadster as we did for the original, end quote. Well, nothing surprising about that statement. Uh, I have said this on the podcast before, but it's just my opinion that I'd be willing to take to the bank here. There's just zero chance. There's a almost zero chance that the $200,000 supercar was going to have the same five color choices that, by the way, are, for the most part, almost a decade old now. Uh, the... The blue came online uh, a few years after the S started production. They got rid of the super dark blue metallic and moved to the blue that they've got now. The, uh, I guess the midnight silver metallic replaced what was originally called actually dolphin gray was the original name of the original gray. If you ever see an older Model S, it'll definitely have a nose cone on the front. Uh, that, that is a lighter gray that kind of really does look like the same gray that a dolphin is. Now you'll know what that is. It's not an aftermarket thing. That's actually the original gray paint that Tesla offered. Anyway, uh, yeah, those most of the, the five paint choices that you have on any Tesla today have been around for a long, long time, and there's just no chance that the, the supercar was going to have those same those same kind of getting stale color choices that the rest of the fleet has. And uh, as I also said before, I think the Roadster is going to be painted in South Paint, the South Paint shop in Fremont that's being spun up now. They used to paint car parts in South Paint, but they're going to start using it for cars. And I am of the opinion that they're going to do the low volume stuff in South Paint, meaning the Roadster the S and the X, all three vehicles that will need uh, higher quality paint jobs, which, spoiler alert, of course, take longer, thus and but are befitting of the 
the fact that they're higher price cars and they take longer, which matches up with a, lo- a lower volume vehicle, which of course, you know, that would be, it would be counterproductive to try and do the uh, higher quality paint jobs in alongside the high volume cars. Those are going to get cranked out, I'm sure, of the existing North paint shop. My hope is that the exact, and I do mean exact, stunning red that's on the Roadster prototype does get offered. And I do mean exact. I'm talking whatever the same amount of coats of paint, the same amount of paint stages that are in, that are involved in that paint job, the exact prototype paint job. It is absolutely stunning, which I did share with you. I got to see it out in the sunlight for the first time ever back at Battery Day, and it is stunning in person. It's absolutely breathtaking in person, if I if I may be so uh, fanboy drooly for a minute. It, re- it really is an impressive color. I would like to nominate it as, it's so impressive, I think it should be the new signature red for the Roadster. Although, uh, I have to nod my head in with a, with a smile in agreement at Ride the Lightning listener Dana. She suggested that the Roadster signature red should be called, or the, the, the prototype red, should be called Terraform Me Red, which given, I, I told her, I replied, I said, given the, there's a bit of an orange tint to that prototype's red paint job in direct sunlight, it's still very much a red car, but you can kind of see hints of orange in it. So I thought that that seemed like a pretty apt and cool name for the prototype red. If if Elon decides to go with that, I, I nominate Dana's suggestion of Terraform Me Red. All right, let's see here. Two more stories this week. The first of those is that the fifth beta build, FSD Beta 5, came out this week. And Elon promising before its release that, quote, the improvement should be significant. And now that that beta is indeed out, there are videos using it all over the Tesla community. And I have to say, it it is very impressive from what I can see. Now, the good news for all of us who don't have the beta yet is that we're in countdown mode now. It's November 27th as I record this. It's November 29th or later, as probably most of you are hearing this. And so, if all goes well, this full self-driving update should be rolling out wide within the next three to four weeks. It is right around the corner. It's coming soon. Uh, it's right around the corner that the car itself can now make take by itself. It can put its signal on and make that turn. Now, remember, there's another part of this. If Tesla does release this uh, and release it wide, not just in beta, if they do that before December 31st, they will be able to recognize a bunch of full self-driving package revenue that they've had sitting in the bank from when people pay their seven, eight, nine, now ten thousand dollars. But officially, accounting-wise, they have not been able to count all of that towards their financials because not all of the features have been delivered. So there is a significant motivator here to inspire Tesla to to hit the deadline, which I'm sure the the deadline is before December 31st, but at the very latest, push it out December 31st. And then that revenue can be realized on the Q4 books. Although cynically, maybe it's not even cynically to say this, but cynical to say this, but it might make more sense, or let's just put it this way. If the beta is not quite, if, if it's full self-driving updates, not quite ready to roll out wide at the end of December and it rolls into January or even February potentially, I think uh, Tesla might not super mind that because then they would get to realize that revenue in Q1 instead of Q4. And Q1, as you well know by now, is always the slowest quarter of the year for Tesla or pretty much for anybody as far as as I know. And especially compared to Q4, Q4 is typically the biggest quarter of the year. So that realizing that revenue that's already in the bank, but not able to be put on the books, it could end up being more beneficial to the company 
to uh, save that for Q1. So I guess that's my super long-winded way of saying if this does, I don't think Tesla will purposely hold it till January. I don't think they would do that. But if it does slip to January because it's just not ready yet, I would A, not be surprised if that happens here as a, as a customer, as somebody who has that software coming my way. And as Tesla, I would, I would think they would probably not mind if, that, if it pushes out a little bit. So we'll see, but it's uh, it's coming up soon, one way or another. Whether it's you know whether it's 2020 or whether it's the beginning of 2021. Finally, this week, some I, I always hate to end on bad news, but there are not. I, I'm obliged to mention this stuff. It is important. It's not the best news to share, but there are not one but two minor recalls to tell you about this week, and I want to tip my cap to Tesla Roddy for both of these uh, write ups. So before I wrap up this week, I wanted to mention first the Model Y recall. Tesla has issued a recall of up to 437 Model Y all-electric crossovers because of a steering wheel bolt issue, according to NHTSA documents, which read, quote, the subject population, meaning the 437 cars, is compromised, uh, excuse me, is comprised of Model Y vehicles built during a two-month period in which manufacturing records cannot confirm that the front upper control arm was properly fastened to the steering knuckle. The production dates are from August 28th of 2020 to November 6th of 2020, so that's just a few weeks ago. The bolts that connect the front upper control arm to the steering knuckle may not have been torqued to the recommended level. This can cause the upper control arm to separate from the steering knuckle, which can result in, quote, excessive negative or positive camber and adverse impact to steering. So it uh, doesn't sound like a safety issue per se, but a significant tire wear issue is what you'd be, and, and a, a less pleasant driving experience, to be sure. That's not to under, understate this. Now, again, these are very recent Model Ys. So if you haven't already been contacted by Tesla about this, you only need to worry about it if you just took delivery, really, over the last couple months. But if you have not heard from Tesla yourself yet, feel free to take it upon yourself to make a service appointment in your Tesla app, and I'm sure they will get you taken care of quickly and painlessly. Now, the second recall is a bit more substantial and uh, arguably a bit more serious. It is for early build Model Xs, and I do mean from the from VIN 1, from the jump. Tesla has filed a recall for 9,136 Model X that were produced between September 17, 2015 and July 31st, 2016 via, again, the NHTSA and as Electrek writes up. Tesla described the, the description of the defect as follows, quote, the Model X is equipped with a cosmetic applique at the front of the roof. Am I saying that correctly? I hope so. Uh, at the front of the roof, just behind the windshield, known as the front applique, app, oh boy, applique, as well as an applique at the center of the roof in between the upper Falcon door roof glass, known as the spine applique. Both appliques, boy, if you're taking a shot, if you're playing a drinking game and uh, the word happened to be applique, which I don't think has ever been said on this show until now, you are already hammered. I'm sorry. Uh, both appliques are adhered to the vehicle using urethane. If the applique to urethane interface lacks primer, then over time the adhesion may weaken, causing the applique to separate from the vehicle. That's, this is Tesla's own words here. While Tesla noted that it is not aware of any injuries or accidents that were caused by the Model X's adhesive issue, the applique could separate from the vehicle when it is driving. This could create a road hazard for following motorists and increases the risk of injury or a crash. Model X owners whose vehicles are part of the recall are likely to detect noise inside the cabin or observe the applique coming loose. To address this issue, Tesla service will be inspecting affected vehicles and applying a retention test on them. If the Model X's applique passes the retention test, then no action would be necessary. Otherwise, Tesla service would apply primer at the urethane to applique interface as needed. 
uh, blah, 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 blah. Tesla service centers were notified on November 17th. Owners affected by the recall could expect to receive messages from Tesla about the issue. So again, uh, this one certainly sounds bad. In short, the panel on the roof of the Model X that sits behind the big sky windshield and in between the Falcon wing doors could fly off the car. And let's be honest, yes, that sounds bad. And yeah, it's not great. (laughs) That is not a great situation uh, that could potentially happen to those early build Xs. Again, this affects the very first Model Xs. I'm talking, these are Autopilot 1 Xs from VIN 1 up through the first months of production there. And as Tesla Roddy noted, yes, you should expect to hear from Tesla about this if you're in the affected VIN range. But again, as I said with the Model Y, feel free to schedule an appointment proactively in the app if you're in this group. Now, the good news is that it clearly isn't a major problem now or yet, depending on which word you want to use, because we haven't heard about this. As you even heard Tesla said, we have not heard of any reported incidents of this, but uh, it obviously has been designated a potential problem. So here is hoping that Tesla is able to nip this in the bud before any actual on-road mishaps occur. And again, just a reminder here, I don't want to underplay this, but at the same time, Every car company in the industry, practically every model of car, has recalls. It's not a huge deal in and of itself, but we don't want anybody to get hurt, and we don't want anything to be damaged on either the affected cars, the affected Teslas themselves, or in the case of the Model X recall, we don't want to see any other cars get damaged either, because that can cause, I mean, damage is one thing, but that could cause somebody to get into an accident. So hopefully these vehicles will all get their recall service performed swiftly and painlessly, and uh, they'll be rectified forever and nobody will, uh, will suffer either, either damage wise or, or any other way, but two very uh, unfortunate recalls to pass along this week, particularly that model X one. That's uh I mean, only a few hundred Model Ys were affected by that first one I mentioned, 437 versus 9,000 Xs. That's, uh, that's going to be a lot of checking appliques for, uh, for the service centers. All right, that will wrap it up for the week in Tesla news. Stick with me, though. I'll be right back after a word from Teslab, and I've got plenty of your awesome phone calls lined up in the Ride the Lightning hotline right after this. Before I move on with the podcast, a big thank you to Teslab for once again sponsoring Ride the Lightning. Now, to remind you what Teslab is all about, it's basically like a fitness tracker for your car, like a Tesla version of a Fitbit or an Apple Watch. Teslab is an incredibly useful app that complements your Tesla ownership experience by helping you see and understand exactly how your vehicle is performing well beyond what the car shows you. And I'm extra proud to have them sponsoring the show again because they have kicked off a fantastic new initiative that I am really, really excited about. There is a new feature in Teslab that calculates the CO2 emissions of your charging sessions. It actually reads from your local utility to determine where the energy is coming from and then calculates your carbon impact. But that's not the awesome part. The really great part of this is that Teslab is partnering with One Tree Planted to allow you to offset the carbon impact of your energy usage if you so choose. It works by choosing the level you want to offset and then submitting payment. You can do this on an ongoing basis or just as a one-time thing. Once your order goes through, they send the funds to One Tree Planted, which helps with reforestation and thus offsetting your carbon impact. So if you're like me and want to make sure you're living as sustainably as possible, check out teslab.app slash RTL to learn more. It's free to sign up and you can start planting trees as soon as your first charge. And remember that the Teslab app is free to use for life, but you can upgrade to a pro account for the price of a coffee and get way more out of it. Check it out. That's teslab.app slash RTL, T-E-Z-L-A-B dot A-P-P slash R-T-L. 
Time for the call-in part of the podcast, better known as the Ride the Lightning Hotline. If you've got a question, comment, or discussion topic as it relates to Tesla, give me a call. I would absolutely love to hear from you. I enjoy this part of the show very much. I get to hear from all of you. So you can call in in one of two easy ways. Either use your smartphone's built-in voice recording software, record your question. Please try to keep it to 90 seconds or less, please, so that I can get through as many callers each week as possible. And email that file to me at teslapodcast at gmail.com. Alternatively, you can uh, send that same 90 second or less question right to the Ride the Lightning hotline. Just call up and leave a message anytime, day or night. The toll-free number to call or Skype is 1-888-989-8752. Again, that's 1-888-989-TSLA. And hey, if you know someone special with an upcoming birthday, anniversary, graduation, or some other special occasion, you can give them a unique gift of recorded voices from friends and family telling them why they're special. The recordings can be podcasted or put onto a keepsake. If you'd like to learn more, visit lifeonrecord.com. Let me kick it off this week with Brian from Minneapolis. Go ahead, Brian. Hi, Ryan. This is Brian calling from Minneapolis. I'm calling because I'm wondering, to your knowledge, has Tesla really started training the autopilot neural network to work in wintertime? Um, being from Minnesota, we obviously get winter like most of the country uh, in the Midwest, and the autopilot system turns off when it notices that there's inclement weather or it, it can't see a uh, snow-covered ground. Now, I can't imagine that Tesla would want to continually ignore this type of training to the system, considering that if they want the robo-taxi fleet to work across the entire United States, then they're going to have to start training the system on how to drive in the snow. Um, so, I, I mean, I can't imagine that Tesla would really dump snow on any sort of autopilot test track they have set up, especially if it's in California that might melt during the <laughs> during the summer months there. Um, but I, I also know that, you know, Again, once once it starts to get uh, weather up here, as far as uh, snow is concerned, the system shuts off. So there, it's not really learning anything. And uh, I was just wondering if if uh, you think that Tesla should really start training the system on on uh, winter weather driving anytime soon. Thank you. That is an interesting topic, Brian. Thank you for bringing it up. We do know for a fact that Tesla does winter weather testing up in Alaska. They did it with the three. They did it with the Y. There are videos out there to prove it. So I suspect that they are also putting autopilot builds through their paces up there as well, including the full self-driving beta that's out in the wild now. Now, maybe that's not uh, being used by paying customers, the general public, that may be internal Tesla folks testing out that software build in extreme cold conditions, but I would bet the farm that they are doing exactly that in some way, shape, or form. Now, that said... We do know that there are physical limitations of the cameras and the radar. You mentioned how autopilot features can either be disabled or limited if the cameras can't see properly. I've had that happen in a good rainstorm here in San Francisco as well. Uh, Not that I'm defending it, by the way, is what I'm about to say next, but Tesla never promised full self-driving would work in all weather conditions. But again, not defending. I'm not saying that Tesla would be in the right if they claim that at all. Just kind of want to point that out as a potential caveat. But more to your point, I am sure they are testing it, but there may be instances that it can never handle with the just the limitations of the current cameras in the cars, the current hardware suite that's in the fleet now. I will be curious to see what we learn from members of the Tesla community once the full self-driving release does go out to the public, hopefully again later this month, maybe next, depending, but uh, meaning later, sorry, later, it's not December yet, later in December or maybe January to to my point earlier in the podcast. But anyway, uh, regardless whether it's December or January, that would of course be winter time for the Northern Hemisphere and mean some snowy conditions for people like yourself and many other Tesla owners out there, a good chance to put that full self-driving software through its cold weather paces. Let me go now to Kaz from San Diego. He's up next. Go ahead, Kaz. Hey, everyone. Kaz out here in San Diego. Just wanted to call in and chat. It's been a little while. 
I just hit 50,000 miles in my standard range Model 3. I use it for work. Just took delivery in March of this year, so it's definitely been busy. Um, in regard to Matthew from Brooklyn in episode 276 and the Cybertruck and the Mars mission and quick shout out to serial number 8. Can't wait to see that fly. But thanks to an awesome friend of mine, I was actually able to be at the unveil for Cybertruck. And though I didn't get a test ride, I did get to take part in the virtual test ride. And the last leg of that, you are in fact cruising to the latest Martian colony through a valley on the red planet. And it, it was awesome looking around, seeing the dusty atmosphere and the red landscape with no roads. It could have just been for fun, but who knows? Maybe there is a, a bigger destiny for the Cybertruck. Take care. Cuz, thank you for that. I was not able to do the VR tour of the Cybertruck that they had at the unveiling event a year ago because I spent most of the night waiting in line to ride in the real prototype. Now, that's to say, no regrets, certainly. I, I'm glad I spent the time. It was invaluable and just such a wonderful privilege to get to ride in the real thing. But yes, thank you. I appreciate you mentioning that the Mars portion of that VR tour because I did not know about that until your call there. So thank you very much for sharing that. Take care, my friend. Always look forward to your calls. Speaking of callers I look forward to, uh, probably my longest calling caller, the person who has been calling in for the longest, Lawton from Chicago. Uh, it's been great to chat with him on the Patreon Hangouts for the Maximum Plaid tier folks as well. Uh, Lawton, great guy out of Chicago, commenting on the full self-driving upgrades. Go ahead, Lawton. Hi, Ryan. It's Lawton from Chicago. Wanted to get my thoughts on the recent hot topic on the Ride the Lightning hotline of full self-driving upgrades. Tesla would be smart and savvy to offer an upgrade discount path for current owners with FSD when they purchase a new Tesla. This will go a long way towards further encouraging brand loyalty. Other car manufacturers frequently offer an owner loyalty bonus on new vehicles. While Tesla famously requires all customers, even Elon himself, to pay full price on vehicles, they frequently offer discounts on software upgrades. This, of, of course, is because Tesla's profit margins on software upgrades are outstanding due to zero marginal cost. Thus, Tesla is effectively able to sell all the FSD packages they want without significantly increasing the total cost of developing and distributing the software. Under such a program, when a current owner purchases a new Tesla, Tesla is able to profit from both industry-leading margins on the vehicle sale and the outstanding software profit margins, even with a discounted FSD package. Furthermore, Tesla could potentially offer more for your Tesla trade-in since they can resell the vehicle and charge full price for FSD to a new customer. All in all, offering a discount FSD upgrade path for current owners is a win-win for both owners and Tesla alike. As always, appreciate your dedication and support every week to the Tesla community. Best wishes to your family and everyone in the Ride the Lightning family on a safe and healthy holiday season. Look forward to your thoughts. Lawton, thank you as always for your call. I wonder if something like this could get rolled out next year at the same time that Tesla debuts the monthly subscription option. It would make sense, in my mind anyway, to make major changes to the program at that point in time. I mean, it would be a natural time to try some new things and hopefully address the ever-simmering issue of reconciling the rising full self-driving package costs with the loyalty of customers who want to move on to their second or maybe even third Tesla, but are leery of that $10,000 full self-driving package cost. Again, I am optimistic that Tesla will do good here. They will do the right thing. Ron from Chino Hills, California. Go ahead, Ron. Hi, Ryan. This is Ron from Chino Hills, California. First time caller and RTL listener since December 2017 when I got my Model S. I'm guessing you will cover the news of the warranty adjustment program for the S and X infotainment system. After 53,000 miles, my MCU had become pretty much unusable with blank screens, reboots, slow responses, etc. So, I decided to pay $2,500 plus tax for the MCU upgrade. I dropped my car off Monday morning, and by mid-afternoon, I received the email describing the warranty adjustment. I guess I may have been one day too early. I read 
I had read Tesla was repairing MCU ones for $500, but I didn't want to invest in the older technology. However, now that the repair is covered under warranty, I might have opted for the repair. Since the email, I have read some online comments where people think Tesla will replace the MCU-1 with a new MCU-2, should theirs fail. I think that would be great, but I don't think it will happen. I believe they will repair the MCU-1 or replace it with a refurbished one from a car like mine. I personally would prefer a credit, since I had to have either a repair or replacement just to get a, re get a usable MCU. For what it's worth, I did ask for a credit, but was told this was an upgrade as opposed to a repair. I did point out that when I decided to get the upgrade, there was no warranty repair option. If anyone from Tesla is listening, maybe they can offer to restore the radio functionality as a credit for the upgrade. If anyone is curious, the upgrade replaced the instrument cluster and the big touchscreen. And as reported by other others, MCU2 is so much faster in every way. Finally, I got one of those one more thing moments I was unaware of. The upgrade included the FSD computer. Now, I don't have FSD, but I do have enhanced autopilot. I will have to try it out this weekend to see how much of a difference it makes. If I ever sell the car, it's nice to know that the car is FSD capable without any additional hardware. Take care and thanks for the podcast. Hey, Ron, I am sorry to hear of both your EMMC issue and your unlucky timing on your upgrade. Now, to answer your question, or, or at least rather the community chatter about this, Tesla did specifically say that you will not get an MCU2 upgrade if your EMMC is replaced under that revised warranty. It will just be the memory chip upgrade. I mean, I'm glad you seem to be taking it in stride because... As you noted, the MCU2 upgrade is a significant day-to-day -day usability upgrade over the MCU1. I said it when it first rolled out, and I'll say it again real quick. If you have an MCU1 car, which just means uh, it'd be an S or an X, I and you plan on hanging on to it for a number of years, I highly recommend the MCU2 upgrade. I think it's very worth it. Again, I've experienced both MCU one and MCU two, and I, it's a it's a significant difference. It is pretty, it's very very noticeable, uh, and of course everything, just about everything, you no know, ninety five percent of w of what you're doing uh, with the car is as far as controls, other than the steering wheel, is through that screen. So anyway, uh, also I guess I'll note too, the MCU two upgrade should add some resale value to you too. Uh, in addition to your car, in addition to the full self-driving computer upgrade that you got as well. So a couple of more maybe silver linings in that. Happy Electric Motoring, Ron. Thank you so much for being a longtime loyal listener of the podcast. Here's David from Brisbane coming up next. Go ahead, David. Hey, Ryan. It's David here from EVHQ in Brisbane, Australia. Uh, just wanted to say thanks very much for the shout-out a couple of episodes ago uh, in regards to... Um, the phantom braking uh, call out. I really appreciate that. Um, I just wanted to uh, speak to the full self driving transfer between uh, an older car and a newer car. Um, you mentioned uh, Tesla being a smart company and it would be easy for them to be able to figure this one out. And I think you're right. I think really where this one sits is in the subscription model. Um, if you consider that a subscription model to full self-driving is attached to the account of the person, not the car of the person, then the transfer between full self-driving would be very easy between multiple vehicles over time. Um, I think the way you would uh, be able to manage current people who've paid uh, thousands of dollars is basically factor in how long it would take for that $10,000, for example, um, to pay the subscription for full self-driving moving forward um, and utilize that amount as the payment for that ongoing recurring payment for a subscription model. That way then anybody who sold or was involved in an accident or anything could then transition to a new car and still have the full self-driving package available to them with the subscription model. I think that's ultimately where the solution to this one lay. And I think if... Um, Tesla was smart, they'd probably introduce that sooner rather than later. Anyway, uh, just my thoughts on the idea. Uh, thanks again for the call out, and uh, 
hopefully uh, Australia will get the full self-driving beta soon so the right-hand drive people can get a hold of it and uh, sort it out for right-hand drive. Anyway, thanks, Ryan. Really appreciate everything you do um, and hope uh, everybody can visit evhq.com if they get a chance. Cheers. David, good thinking. I am with you on this. We know the subscription model is coming next year, and now it's just a question of learning exactly what the pricing structure is and whether or not it will be, as you wisely suggest, account-based or if it will still be car-based. Fingers crossed that you are correct on this one. A couple, uh, a couple more calls here for this week's show. First, let me go to Walt in Manchester, California to ask a Cybertruck question. Go ahead, Walt. Hi, Ryan. Walt Rush, Manchester, California. Thanks for the show. You do a terrific job keeping us all well informed of what's happening in the Tesla world. Uh, long time listener. Question on the uh, Cybertruck. I know you went to the unveiling and I uh, was wondering if you were able to hear the road noise off of the tires, if there was much road noise. I imagine there was a lot of talking in the car when you guys were on the test drive, but was hoping maybe you could tell me about the tires. Thanks. Have a great day. Well, Walt, I have to be honest with you. I don't really remember. Uh, maybe I did hear it. Maybe I didn't. There was definitely a lot of talking. I mean, each of us passengers, because they had the Cybertruck packed full, uh, we all took turns asking the driver questions about the truck. Also, it was just chaotic and busy, the whole thing. And to be clear, it was quick. It was literally about a 60-second test ride with that thing. So, I mean, I'm not trying to complain, don't get me wrong, but I'm just sort of trying to convey what it was like. So it was tough to try and take in and retain as many sights, sounds, smells as possible. Now, I did film it, and I put it on my YouTube channel, uh, and a ton of other people did too, people with much better equipment than me. This is my, my iPhone at the time. I mean, you could try taking a look at mine. You could try taking a look at some other people and see what you can, what you can hear and what you can discern. Now, again, granted, the the videos uh, have the aforementioned talking in them, as well as the fact that most of them, including mine, were filmed on smartphones and not with professional equipment. So they might not pick up the tire noise the same way the human ear might if you were actually there in the truck. So. There you go. I mean, I'm not sure my answer there was particularly helpful, but uh, I, I'm doing my best. <laughs> Thank you, Walt. Uh, one more caller this week. Rich from Seattle, another frequent caller, taking us home here. Following up on a recent pro tip of the week. Go ahead, Rich. Hey, Ryan. Rich Tong here again. Sorry to leave you another message, but just on that swipe down from the NAS thing, uh, just so you know, if you swipe down and you are at home, it'll actually send you to work in case anyone's still going to work. I find really convenient to take me to my mom's every night. And uh, no, it's not work, but it is convenient. Talk to you soon. Rich, yes, thank you for that. I absolutely should have mentioned that as just an additional point of clarification, so thank you for doing so. Uh, also, another thing I should have clarified is that you need to set the home and work addresses in your car for that little pro tip shortcut to work. But once you do that, Swiping down on that navigation button will navigate you to home if you're anywhere but home and to work if you swipe it down while you're at home. So cheers, Rich. Thanks so much. Thanks to everybody who called in. Keep those calls coming. I would love to hear from you. I gave you the call in information at the top of the segment. So please refer back to that. And with that, I'll take a very brief little musical pause Actually, uh, no, we'll take a Master Chief Steve Downs pause and come right back with the rest of the podcast right after this. This is Steve Downs, the voice of Master Chief, Sierra 117. You're listening to Ride the Lightning, the Tesla unofficial podcast. You know, that Cybertruck looks a lot like a warthog, doesn't it? Master Chief, out. Well, not much going on with me and with my car, which is not a bad thing necessarily. I do plan to wash it tomorrow here over this Thanksgiving holiday weekend. We've been blessed with excellent weather here in San Francisco. So it's a, the forecast looks good. It's got some rain dirt on it from the last time it got rained on, which was like, a, I don't know, a week or week and a half ago. So looking forward to getting it cleaned off. It's always a 
it's always a sort of just therapeutic thing for me to go down there and give it a wash uh, every, you know, two, three weeks or so. And let's see. Ah, yes, your video game recommendation of the week. Uh, this week, I apologize if I've said this one before. I don't think I've mentioned it. If I have, it's been quite a while. But it is a smartphone game, whether you have Android or iOS. Super Mario Run. It is a very old school 2D Mario platformer. But the catch is that it's uh, it's a it's basically you're always running in the game. It is an they're referred to as an endless runner. So Mario is always moving forward, or whichever character you're using, because you can unlock most of the usual crew from the Super Mario Brothers, uh, you know, roster of talent, if you will. And each one has some different tendencies, which uh, which is makes it extra fun. I like Peach the best, actually, because she kind of floats through the air. Uh, anyway, but yeah, Super Mario Run, it's really fun. Like, you can, there's a lot of good content in it. It's not a free-to-play thing, like, or a dollar, like most mobile games are. It's 10 bucks, but then there are no microtransactions. There's no other, you know, it's nothing else. It's just 10 bucks. You get everything. I definitely recommend it. I had a really, really good time with it when it first came out. So, Super Mario Run on your preferred smartphone or tablet. With that, the pro tip of the week comes to us this week from Ryan in Las Vegas. Go ahead, Ryan. Hey, Ryan. This is Ryan from Las Vegas. I'm a proud owner of a Long Range Model 3, and I've had it since July. I'd like to first thank you for your amazing Xbox review on IGN. It's funny. You say Elon has his Elonverse, I feel like you also have somewhat similar thing as your McCaffrey verse uh, in this example. You really did a very great and detailed job on that review. My pro tip is this. I recently got the acceleration boost from the Tesla app, and there's a couple of things that they don't tell you which you should probably know to enable it. So once you go into the app and pay for it with Apple Pay or with a credit card, they say you have to be connected to Wi-Fi and it'll take several hours, but that's not the case. I was in a parking structure with the cellular connection and all you do is a hard reset. So you click in both buttons on the steering wheel as well as hold the brake down. And it says 30 seconds, but you do it until the car shuts off and then returns on and goes back to the normal screen. And then to check that it worked, you just go into settings and it's under driving in the sports acceleration. Hope that helps everyone and have a great day. Fellow Ryan, thank you very much for calling in with your experience about this. I trust that will help people who are interested in that upgrade. I mean, it is. Now it's officially the holiday season. Maybe you're thinking of uh, treating yourself if your car is eligible for that or maybe someone in your family wants to treat you, they know that you would enjoy that. So thought I would play that pro tip there. By the way, uh, speaking of that, I have not heard a single regret from anybody in the community who has done it. I've not read uh, anything or heard from anyone. It is literally all satisfied customers who say that the boost is quite noticeable. So thank you very much for that, Ryan. And again, if anybody out there has a pro tip of the week, Something about your car, about the experience of your car, the car itself, the interface, whatever it is, that might not be obvious, might not be covered in the manual that you think is interesting and worth sharing with your fellow owners and enthusiasts, I would absolutely love for you to call in with it. Please call in the same way that you call in with the regular Ride the Lightning hotline stuff that I told you about earlier in the podcast. All right, now for some friends of the podcast real quick, I hope you'll hang with me for a few more minutes. Maybe something in here jumps out at you as, as uh, something that would be useful to you. First, let me mention, of course, abstractocean.com and their coupon code RTL Podcast, all one word. RTL Podcast will get you 15% off of your order there. Whether you're getting the new, awesome, very factory looking rear footwell lighting kit, whether you're doing the drop in cup holder stabilizer, if you're tired of your water bottle wobbling around in the the cup holder in your car, uh, whether you're doing a tempered glass screen protector, a center console wrap, uh, the TESLA Roadster style lettering for the back of your car. I've seen that on a number of Model 3s around and it looks really nice. So all that and much more 
at abstractocean.com. Again, coupon code RTL Podcast on that one. Meanwhile, uh, puretesla.com slash RTL. That's the website to go to for your one stop dash cam slash sentry mode shop. That is the site to go to. $49 for a 128 gigabyte kit that will basically take care of you for, I don't want to necessarily say forever, but for the long foreseeable future, unlike a regular traditional USB flash memory drive. Uh, these are micro SD based, much better for long-term reliability in this application. So puretesla.com slash RTL works with PC or Mac, comes fully formatted and ships free anywhere in the U S or a moderate shipping fee to ship globally. And then we've got my friends at snap plate. They've got the awesome front license plate bracket for people like me that hate the front license plate and the fact that some states need you to put it on there required by law. It snaps on and off in seconds, paint safe, grill safe, radiator safe, autopilot safe, clean minimal design, blends perfectly with the Tesla front end and leaves no unsightly hardware behind when it's removed. So put it on for uh, toll booths, put it on for parking meters, take it off for pretty much everything else livingtesla.com slash RTL. And I want to quickly note, they also have a brand new holiday themed product. If you scroll, if you go to livingtesla.com slash RTL, scroll about halfway down the page, the third row, you will see, I'll just say the name of it and let you go look at it for yourself because it's really funny to look at in a, in a fun way. The license plate reindeer kit. Yes, you can turn your license plate into a reindeer. Good little holiday uh, fun theme there. Uh, Immaculate Reflections. If you're in the San Francisco Bay Area or going to be here with your car and you would like some wonderful, high-quality detail work done by an absolute craftsman, whether you're looking for paint protection film over part or all of the car, maybe some ceramic coating, maybe paint correction, whatever it is, irdetailing.com. You want to go there Get in touch with Jeff, book in with him, mention that you are a Ride the Lightning listener and there's a discount waiting for you. I promise you will be walk away a happy customer. I want to uh, shout out to Michael from the, the San Francisco Bay Area. Just got his Model Y back from Immaculate Reflections and he sent me a bunch of pictures. He was stoked about the work that was done. So I always like hearing those, those satisfied customer stories because I'm one of them. I'm one of them. Uh, and I think, let's see, is that about it? Ah, Jada. Can't forget them. Because I mentioned this, their uh, big Black Friday discounts are still on for just a couple more days. I believe they end December 1st. So you've got a little a little more time there. The coupon code Ride the Lightning, all one word. And if you use that in conjunction with the Black Friday discounts that are automatically applied right now, you can save up to $45 off of the Jada USB hub and the Jada wireless pad if you're buying them together. So it's 25 bucks off the wireless charging pad, 15 off the USB hub, five off if you need the spacer for the wireless charging pad. Uh, but if you use the coupon code Ride the Lightning and buy both, it's 45 bucks off. Now you don't use the coupon code anyway, but I'm just saying if you buy both and use the coupon code, it's a $45 savings there. So please use the referral link here. It is getjada.com slash R-E-F slash eight, and Jada spelled J-E-D-A. Uh, finally, if you are not subscribing to the podcast already, you can do so completely for free. It just means the podcast will push out to you automatically each and every week. You can subscribe on pretty much all the major podcast platforms. If you are a fan of a podcast platform that I'm not on, please let me know and I will do my best to get the show on there because I want it to be in as many places as possible. But most people get it through Apple Podcasts. There's also a good number of folks on Google Podcasts. You can find it on Stitcher. You can find it on TuneIn, which is in your Tesla. You can find it on Spotify, which is also in your Tesla. Or on YouTube, just in audio-only form. There's no video. But if you want to listen 
via YouTube, you can do that just by searching Ride the Lightning Tesla, just so that it doesn't pick up Metallica stuff. Ride the Lightning Tesla, and you'll find my channel there. Finally, the Patreon. I'll keep it brief. As is hopefully obvious when you listen to it, I mean, I hope so, but a lot of work goes into this thing uh, each and every single week, and I, I do take a lot of pride in making sure the podcast is out every week, even here on the holiday week. So, you know, it's been a strange year. It's, these are strange times, but if you are in a position where you are able to support my efforts on the podcast and, and you are willing to do so, you can do so for as little as five bucks a month. I mean, was that's like a that's a Starbucks uh, once a month to uh, to help you know help help support my efforts on the podcast. But there are the different tiers, all with the cool different little bonuses, uh, on up to the maximum plaid tier, where among many things you'll get your name shouted out every week. And I'm getting ready actually next weekend to do the next. Google Hangout, monthly Google Hangout, which the Maximum Plaid folk are always invited to. And then everybody else gets at least, get they get a, a one-time invite just to, you know, hey, welcome to the Patreon and please come join me and your fellow listeners on uh, on a Google Hangout so we can see and talk to each other. And I've been having a ball on those. So the hour, we've gone over the hour every time because the hour flies by. Anyway, if you are thinking, hey, maybe I will support you. Maybe I'll take a look at this. The website to go to is patreon.com slash Tesla podcast. And Patreon is spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Thank you for hearing me out on that. And with that, I will close as usual with the shout outs. First, to the Maximum Plaid backers, saying thanks to my newest Maximum Plaid tier backer, Tesla Hitchhiker 42. Thank you so much. And then to the rest of the Maximum Plaid crew, Pete White, Danny Nelson, Jonathan Wales, Fernando Cordero, Sean Nidig, Cameron Clark, Daniel Grummer, Seth Capello, and Nick and Tony. Thank you all very, very much. And certainly a thanks as well to the Plaid Level crew. George Cassiopo, David Brander, Alexi Heft, Logan Willis, Robert Maracle, Jason Chalukas, Joe Edgel, Tim Hyde, Lawton from Chicago, Peter Chalet, David Vakil, Ulrich Lassa, Eric Randolph, David Nondahl, Jerry and Mary Smith, Lyle Austin, Joel Sapp, Dory and Steve Guberman, Jeremy, Tesla Owners Taiwan, Ron Lee, Jeremy Harris, John Cody, Charlie Gillespie, Kaz Barnes, Neil Weaver, David Perella, Sunil Joseph, Dennis Peake, Will Stedman, E.V. Tricity UK, Stig Mickey Jensen, Jeff Angwin, Chase Cabanillas, Richard Folkers, Trenton from Myrtle Beach, The Lydia Family, Michael Regal, Mark Eversoll, Ish, Chris Beach, Aaron Altschul, Steve Radspinner, Jared Brown, Jerome Strack, Jamie Dalton, Noel and Lucy Murphy, my friend on Twitter, at Rodam, John Schmidt, Eric St. Pierre, and Steve Drumheller. Thank you all very much for your continued and generous Patreon support. All right, that will do it for another week of Tesla action here on Ride the Lightning. I'll tell you, I was a little worried. I was like, mm, holiday week, especially real short holiday week. Maybe there's not going to be a lot to talk about this week. Nope, plenty. There's <laughs> another fun week, mostly fun, except for the recalls, but there's always plenty to talk about pretty much every week, man. And I love it. Thank it's. I love that there's always something new and usually exciting, not always, but usually exciting to talk about. It's, I mean, hey, the fact that there's always new stuff, it's, it, it makes it exciting for me to keep doing the podcast. I love it. Uh, I sincerely appreciate you listening if you got this far. And for a snoozing Daisy the Boxer to my left, I'm Ryan McCaffrey. This was Ride the Lightning episode 278. Officially, happy holidays to all of you. Happy electric motoring. And I'll see you back here next week. I mean, I think a Tesla is the most fun thing you could possibly buy ever. That's what it's meant to be. Our goal is to make... It's, it's not exactly a car. 
it's actually a thing to maximize enjoyment. It's maximum fun. 